Today's video is partially sponsored by Outs. Outs is a growing general store, providing essential items for those out active. These hood tech military cargos. These is fire. A lot of you don't know how to dress these days and you know it. Some of you are old heads, out of touch, and don't know what to buy, so get these. Also, if you're not one to wear shorts in the summer, these joints will provide you with some style. Just make sure you got on some good feats though. These are $18, light bread. Get yours, they have them in different colors. We got ours already. This story starts one place and ends up somewhere else. Stick with us. So, in its heyday, roller skating was a huge attraction, a draw for leg warmer wearers, disco enthusiasts and anyone not afraid of a few bumps and bruises. Today, there are just a small handful of rinks left in the five boroughs. The pastime is a shadow of what it once was. Though roller skating enjoyed its biggest boom during the days of disco, it's always had its ups and downs not just in New York, but all over. The sport began after the Civil War, just after James Plimpton of Massachusetts invented the quad or four-wheeled skate, which worked better than previous inline inventions. Roller witnessed its first boom after the turn of the century, when the spread of labor laws meant that working classes finally had free time to visit roller rinks. Then, the Great Depression struck, and rinks that opened in the Roaring Twenties came to a grinding halt. Although figure skating was already an Olympic sport, roller skating wasn't and still isn't but once upon a time most ice rinks weren't open year-round, and people wanted to skate. One of the earliest facilities in the city was the second Madison Square Garden. Early skating was pretty hardcore, one man died in a bizarre six-day roller skating marathon at MSG back in 1885. Flash forward a century, and the Roxy was the place to be. The Chelsea rink was a haven for skaters and partiers alike. It was a beloved city hotspot, but in 2007, the Roxy turned off its disco ball. That same year, Brooklyn's Empire Roller Skating Center then more than 60 years old closed its doors. But the year before that, in 2006, Skate Key in the Bronx also closed its doors. That is really the beginning focus of our story today. Skate Key, Bronx. If you ask some of the older people, they would tell of the great times they had here at the Skate Key. It was located on 138th Street and Canal Street. This is the Mott Haven area of the Bronx. In close proximity was the Mitchell Projects. Also close by was the Madison Avenue Bridge, which leads to Harlem. Soon as you cross the bridge to Harlem, you would be in the vicinity of other housing projects, such as Riverton, Lincoln Houses, and Savoy Projects. Indeed, the Bronx and Harlem, because of its close proximity, have intermingled either for the better or worse. By the mid-2000s, the Bronx Gate Key, as residents would call it, the key, started to become dangerous. If you didn't see it as dangerous, you were someone who went and understood it might go down. If staying dangerous was a term back then, then that would be the mentality. See, growing up in New York, you realize that you and the people around you determine the future. Did the young people who contributed to the violence that would ultimately close these skating rinks think selfishly? Of course not. Well, not in the sense that their action would change the trajectory of things. We would have a skating right now if people could control their emotions. But this generation of young people are built on much emotion. In 2006, a shooting near the popular roller rink skate key had prompted a renewed effort to have the establishment shut down. Police were investigating whether an argument outside Skate Key led to the shooting of a 15-year-old three blocks away. Police said the boy was shot in the collarbone by a stray bullet. He was in stable condition. This was far from the first time there has been trouble associated with Skate Key. In 2005, the rink was temporarily shut down after it sold alcohol to auxiliary police officers posing as minors. The rink was ordered to close earlier than 3 a.m., but about two weeks after, that restriction was lifted. Police say since 2000, at least 12 people were either shot or stabbed inside the rink or nearby. The community wanted it gone. These events would ultimately lead to its shutdown. July, 2003. An altercation that escalated into a stabbing frenzy left a security guard critically injured and eight other people wounded, including five police officers. The guard, Stephen, 20, of Harlem, was stabbed four times outside the skate key at 12.20 a.m. after he had escorted someone out of the rink after a fight, the police said. He was listed in critical condition with liver damage at Lincoln Hospital. Two other men and a 15-year-old boy were stabbed in the fight, two of the victims near the roller rink and the third near the building entrance, and were listed in stable condition at the same hospital. 
Five police officers received minor injuries in the fracas, the police said. Four people, including Stephen's 32-year-old brother, Laren, were arrested on various charges, and seven others were issued summonses. Laren was charged with assaulting a police officer after he ran to his brother's bloodied body, Keith, also 32, was also charged with assaulting a police officer. At one point, the police had apprehended 12 people and recovered a knife at the scene. The police detained several people, spraying mace and throwing people to the ground. The fight started near the roller rink, which is inside a recreation center that includes video arcades and a dance floor. But it was said that those involved were members of the Valhalla gang, also known as the Bloods. They wore red do-rags, red shirts, and red and black beads. The fight began when someone disrespected another group or something. Stephen, one of several security guards on duty Saturday night, removed a man from the club and then went to have a cigarette with his girlfriend and another guard. That was when five men jumped Stephen and stabbed him in the back, right arm, torso and backside. The men also struck his girl, leaving her with a swollen lip and loose tooth. September of 2003. Seven youths were wounded in Harlem when a 16-year-old opened fire on a group of people following a night out at the Key. The violence erupted as more than 100 youths streamed across the Madison Avenue bridge into Harlem from the Skate Key Rink across the river in the Bronx. Cops said some of the teens had gotten into an argument at the rink earlier in the night, possibly stemming from an altercation in previous weeks, and the gunman, Ray Ray, 16, had returned to settle the score. Ray Ray allegedly opened fire at about 2.30 a.m. on West 138th Street between 5th and Lenox Avenues, spraying bullets into the crowd and wounding six teens and a 20-year-old man. Ray Ray was arrested on the spot by officers on patrol, but no gun was recovered. Some witnesses told cops they saw a second gunman, and investigators were trying to determine if he had an accomplice. Neighbors complained that huge groups of teens crossed the bridge on weekend nights after leaving the skate key, and there are often problems and sometimes violence. I came down around 2.15 to get some cigarettes at the store. As soon as I came out, I saw hundreds of kids and heard lots of shouting and screaming, said a man who identified himself only as Philip. I said forget it, I'm going back upstairs. It looked bad. As soon as I came back up, I heard 9 to 10 shots ring out, said the man, who lives in the Riverton houses on the Harlem side of the bridge. I looked out my window, and in front of the post office on 138th Street, everyone had scattered, but there were four kids standing there, one of them waving a gun. The grandmother of one of the victims, said he and another boy knew Rare. There was some kind of beef two weeks prior, which resulted in this shooting. Ray Ray was charged with assault and weapons possession. The injured were taken to Harlem and St. Luke's hospitals and were all in stable condition. The victims were all boys from Harlem. At 2 a.m. on a Monday, March 8, 2004, a fight erupted at the Key. According to police sources, the victims, ages 22, 33 and 37, got into a fight with a 24-year-old over a woman. The 37-year-old was slashed in the forehead and left arm. One guy, James, had suffered what turned out to be a mortal stab wound in the chest, but another guy, Kyle, had suffered potentially life-threatening stab wounds in the stomach and back. The female witness who was standing within inches of James when he was stabbed, helped him outside where he collapsed in the street. She immediately and spontaneously identified a dude named Drell as James' attacker to a police sergeant assigned to the area outside Skate Key. He asked if anyone knew who stabbed the victim. Rel fled on foot with the sergeant and witness in pursuit. Two uniformed police officers, who were notified at 2.15 a.m. of an assault in progress, joined in the chase in their patrol car and finally caught up with Rel a few blocks away. They handcuffed defendant with his hands behind his back and placed him in the back seat of their cruiser. The sergeant instructed these two officers to transport Rel to the nearby hospital where James had been taken by ambulance and to conduct a show-up. At the time, the sergeant suspected that James was probably going to lose his life. When the two officers reached the hospital, one of them stayed with Rel in the car, which was parked in the emergency room parking lot. The other officer went into the hospital where he learned James' name and discovered that he was unconscious and being worked on, rendering a show-up impossible. On his way out of the emergency room, he ran into the witness and the male companion, who were walking quickly in his direction. In light of their distraught rushed appearance, the witness crying, the officer, acting on a hunch, asked them why they were there. When the witness responded that her friend James had been stabbed. 
The officer asked the two of them if they knew anything about what had happened at Skate Key, and they said that they did. He then asked them if they would be able to in any way identify any suspects involved in the case, and they also said they would. The officer did not know that the witness had already identified Rel to the sergeant as James attacker. The officer radioed for a patrol car. He explained to the witness and her companion that he would place them in this car to view someone or to show them someone who might have been involved in the incident. Once this patrol car arrived, the witness and her companion climbed inside, and the officer told them that he was going to put a bright light on the individual, and if it's the perp, to let him know. The officer next called on the operator of the newly arrived patrol car to turn on the takedown lights on top of the vehicle. At the officer's signal, his fellow officer then guided Rel, who remained rear handcuffed, to the lighted area and stood next to him. When the officer asked the witness and her companion if they could identify Rel, the witness said, that's him, and her companion agreed. On April 1, 2004, the grand jury indicted Rel for a litany of crimes in connection with the fight at Skate Key. So, this section of the story has more moving parts. So check this out. After sitting in jail for five years awaiting his trial, a Bronx man was cleared of all of the charges against him. Michael Acoli, 22, had been behind bars at Rikers Island since 2004, when he was accused of being involved in a shooting outside the key. Michael also known as Bling Blau, was carrying an unloaded gun at the time of the crime, but claimed his friend, Young Briss, was the one who pulled the trigger, hitting two people and killing a 21-year-old. Now, Michael, or Bling Blau, was one of the most cherished members of the Mac Bowler gang. As for Young Briss, he was a well-known member of the YGs. He would plead guilty and get a 6-10 to 10 year sentence. He was only 14, so he received a relatively light sentence. His name rang bells in Horizons Juvenile Center. Allegedly, he would eventually become Mac Bowler when he got to Rikers Island. Bling Blau and Young Briss was from 187th and Webster Avenue. That's one block from a crew called YNR, who harbored the area as well. Currently, not sure if they are the same crew, have beef or whatever. Anyway, Bling would fight the case of the shooting at Skate Key, and in 2009, after five years, it was ruled, not guilty. After the verdict was delivered, he told the tabloid that during his time in jail, he missed the little things, like being outside, talking on the phone whenever I want to. I grew up in here. I lost my whole teenage and childhood for something I didn't do. Bling would win a lawsuit as well. In May of 2011, Bling would be found shot in the head and back on Webster Avenue and 188th Street. He was taken to St. Barnabas Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Nearly a year later, a couple dozen friends gathered in front of his building to pay their respects. They lighted candles, dozens of them. It would have been Bling's birthday that Wednesday. Gunshots rang out. Suddenly, there was a new victim to mourn. About 10.30 p.m., a man walked up to the gathering and shot one of Mr. Acoli's friends, Jonathan Lewis, twice in the torso, the police said. Mr. Lewis, 22, was declared dead at St. Barnabas Hospital. Police officers who responded to the shooting soon arrested a suspect, Daryl Patillo, 18, after finding him hiding under a van less than five blocks from the vigil. Mr. Lewis had known Bling since they were young, growing up four blocks apart, and he was among Bling's friends who wanted to honor him at the vigil, his relative said. This area is small, said Mr. Lewis's sister. I know it hurt him when Bling was killed. Bling's lawyer said that after his release, he had spent some time in Washington or Maryland, but had returned to the Bronx, where he was living off money he had received from two lawsuits. He had been a member of a local Bloods gang, adding that Bling had wanted to get out of the neighborhood for his own safety. He really forecasted his own death, Bling's lawyer said, he kind of knew if he was in this, eventually that would happen. Bling's killing remains unsolved. By Thursday morning, Bling's memorial had grown to make room for Mr. Lewis's. A candle was put down for him next to those placed for Bling. Mr. Patillo, who was being held on charges of second-degree murder and criminal possession of a weapon, had not been arraigned as of Thursday afternoon. The police said they had recovered the weapon a 38 caliber revolver near the shooting. Mr. Patillo had been arrested in the past, but details about those cases were not available because they had all been sealed. Daryl Patillo would finally have his day of reckoning two years later. The 20-year-old killer learned he'll spend 20 years to life in prison. 
Before the hearing could start, Patillo's wrists had to be shackled and protective mitts placed on his hands, and seven court officers stood over him. Patillo who managed to scuttle his sentencing, on June 9, when he apparently swallowed a metallic object to avoid the hearing, still managed to delay the proceedings for more than three hours Thursday. When it finally got underway, the cowardly Patillo showed little emotion while the mother and sister of Jonathan Lewis, whom he killed on April 25, 2012, described the toll his actions had taken on their family. Patillo, wearing an orange jail jumpsuit, declined to speak before Bronx Supreme Court Justice John Moore read his sentence. You have been difficult to deal with, Moore said, referring to Patillo's refusal to appear on June 9. You've shown no remorse, the judge continued, noting that Patillo was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, a mental condition that causes people to callously disregard the rights, wishes and feelings of others, according to the Mayo Clinic. Mr. Patillo, you need help. But that's the end of this story. Just wanted to talk a little bit about the key. But as always, stay low and thanks for watching.